okay good evening so uh, this is our ninth lecture and uh, today we will start our discussion on the flow resigns okay so basically uh, as i told you earlier also so if you see uh, from earlier lectures then we have seen that the two broad classifications of the phase distributions in one case the phases were so intermingled with each other that it was not very clear to separate the boundary between the phases okay so that's why we were calling these as completely dispersed flows on contrary in another situation where we can actually create a clear distinction of the boundary between the phases then we were calling these as nothing but the separated flows okay but in between the fully separated and the fully dispersed flows there can be many uh, another uh, set of flow distribution arrangements okay so we will try to see that what type of flow distribution arrangements will be actually existing and each flow distribution arrangement between the phases is something which is called as flow resign okay or either a flow <coughs> pattern so what i am saying is that among number of distributions whatever a specific distribution we are talking about that specific distribution we will be naming it as either a flow resign or a flow pattern is this point clear a specific distribution of phases now when we will be talking about the specific distribution of phases that will be dependent upon different different things okay so for example if you consider different different volumetric flux of the two quantities superficial velocities okay so say you have a pipe and in this pipe if you consider that one fluid is having some volumetric flux jl other fluid is having volumetric flux j v so depending upon the different values of the volumetric fluxes there can be different set of phase distributions okay now in this horizontal tube itself if i change my cross section of the tube from circular to a square cross section or a rectangular cross section then also the phase distribution will be actually changing okay so it means that first thing which i can say is that channel size and cross section is one of the important factor which can actually change the phase distribution okay in the similar way instead of a horizontal channel if i consider a vertical channel then also my effect of dominant forces will be completely changing for example for a horizontal channel gravity is acting in this direction perpendicular to the flow direction major flow direction on contrary if i take a vertical channel okay so in case of a vertical channel if i say my flow is from downward to upward direction then gravity is actually acting in the direction of the in the direction opposite to the direction of the flow so parallel to that okay so of course their effect of different forces will be different so that's why there will be different uh, phase distribution so that's why second thing i can say that channel orientation okay now you might be remembering a uh, one fundamental concept from uh, our basic uh, uh, fluid mechanics course when we talk about the flow of single phase through a tube so in case of single phase flow through a tube we typically say that we have some entrance region and after that entrance region actually we say whether flow is fully Uh, laminar fully developed laminar flow or fully developed turbulent flow and whenever we talk about the entrance region so entrance region is the specifically the portion in case of even single phase flows which is very less studied uh, less studied and we do, we don't have exact uh, theoretical formulations to determine different uh, effect of different parameters in the dolphin region okay and moreover it is typically said even in case of single phase flows as well that whatever is the kind of entrance how we are allowing fluid to enter into the pipe that
that significantly controls the length of the entrance region. So if we have very smooth entrance, then there will be less entrance region. If we have very disturbed entry into the pipe for fluid, even if it is a single phase flow, then we will be having a completely disturbed situation. So it means that uh, to some extent, it will also depend that how we are introducing the uh, flow into the channel. Okay, so it means inception mechanism or I should say flow introduction mechanism into the channel. For example, when I am talking about two phase flow arrangement, I can have one arrangement as a this is my pipe cross section. I have taken some Y channel kind of thing and then I have allowed two phases to enter like this. Okay. So in this case what will be happening obviously at this point there will be some disturbance or some intermixing because of the flow. On contrary in one arrangement I can have say this is parallel but then at the entry point this is not angle but this is just a straight section. So just a bifurcation plate. So here entry will be more smoother. Okay. On contrary I can have third type of arrangement where I have taken a central core portion through which one fluid is entering and then outer annular portion through which phase 2 is entering. Okay. So here phase 2, here phase one. So it means that I can have different different arrangements for the phases to enter into the tube. So when I will be having different different arrangements, all these different arrangements actually will try to somehow control the flow uh, pattern or distribution of phases within the pipe. Okay. Then fourth important point is whether we have adiabatic process or we have diabetic process. So in case of adiabatic process of course there will not be any heat transfer between the phases. So once we do not have any heat transfer in that case we will be finding that all the fluid properties will be remaining constant along the entire length of the channel. On contrary if you talk about diabetic situation that means where one phase is hot and another phase is cold or say we are adding heat into the pipe from the outer uh, tube surface. Okay. So in that case what will be happening uh, because of the heat transfer there can be changes in the fluid properties because we know that viscosity, surface tension, density all these fluid properties are nothing but the temperature dependent. Okay. So if the values of these properties are changing then ultimately we can say that the momentum flux and other quantities of the phases will change. Okay. Because what will be momentum flux? What is the volumetric flux? If I multiply that with density then ultimately it will become momentum flux. Okay. So how strong is the momentum of one phase that will be actually dominating over the another phase and that will help in controlling the phase distribution. So that is why uh, in diabetic situations uh, of course one effect will be changes in fluid properties with temperature and second effect can be if I have phase change heat transfer then what will be happening? If I have phase change heat transfer then the volume fraction of the phases itself will change. Okay. So if volume fraction itself is changing then what will happen? If volume fraction itself is changing that will also actually lead to changes in the flow distribution. Is this point clear? So these are the some of the factors which we have actually uh, over here listed. Now we will try to see that in different situations if we consider the if we consider the uh, if we consider the flow of two phases then uh, what type of phase flow patterns or flow resigns we can actually expect. Okay. So let us move to this portion. So 
one thing is i told you flow resign now along with the flow resign one more keyword is added map this is written as flow resign map so what is the meaning of flow resign map it means one map through which i can simply refer to the controlling parameter and based on these controlling parameter i can tell that how my phase distribution will be existing in the channel okay so any graph or plot which is giving me idea of a flow resign present in a system dependent <coughs> dependent upon the uh, fundamental parameters which we are controlling then actually we can predict that what type of behavior we will be having so majority of the time whenever we will be uh, referring to the literature we will find that majority of the flow resign maps are based on are based on actually visual inspections so people have visualized either through high speed photography or through still camera that for a longer duration what type of phase distribution is actually staying in the pipe and based on that actually they have tried to present their visual inspections in some schematic arrangement or the photographs of the visual inspections and then based on these arrangements actually they have given some names and accordingly marked their occurrence resigns is this one clear in certain cases where visualization of the phases is not possible okay there what people do on a macroscopic scale people measure some parameters for example you can record the pressure data and then you can see that what type of pressure fluctuations are actually happening in a particular controlled condition of for example in this flow resign map you can see along the abscissa what we have mass flux of water so gl is given in kg per centimeter uh, kg per second meter square and here we have mass flux of air which is gg in kg per second meter square okay so depending upon the different different values of this liquid and solid mass flux for air water mixture particularly in a 5.1 cm diameter type uh, tube what one can do one can record the pressure signal okay and in pressure signal if we see the fluctuations so of course for each type of flow distribution there will be some separate separate nature of the pressure fluctuations and then if we perform some spectral analysis and if we try to find the dominant frequencies then we can see that okay this set of frequencies are dominating in this resign so it means if in my pressure signal if i have particular fluctuation then i can say that okay particular dominant frequency fluctuations then i can say okay my this resign is present actually within the pipe so that is the system which is non visualization based but of course if one has to go for non visualization based system then also some sort of mapping with visualization data is necessary in order to train the system is this point clear so right now what we are talking about we are trying to see one flow resign map which is given for horizontal pipe flow and one thing you have to clearly understand this particular flow resign map which we will be discussing over here this is for air water mixture and this is in a horizontal pipe of 5.1 cm internal diameter okay and in this system you can see that when my particularly when the mass flux of the water and mass flux of air is very very small so this portion so here you can see uh, this graph is actually given in the log scale log log scale so that's why it is having wide range of mass flow rates available in this okay so you can see the mass flux is from 10 to 10 to power 4 for water and 10 to around uh, uh, 10 to power minus 1 to 10 and then it is 1 10 so it means sorry this is somewhere close to 10 to power minus 3 in uh, uh, ordinate axis so 10 to power minus 3 to 10 kg per second meter square okay so if you see the first case when your liquid as well as the gas mass flow rates are very small 
okay so particularly this portion so in this portion you are finding that whatever the phase distribution we will be having we will be calling that phase distribution as stratified okay and stratified is the most simplest phase distribution so you can see that this is nothing but my stratified phase distribution so in case of stratified phase distribution this is the pipe if i look into the pipe of course my liquid is the heavier phase so liquid will be staying at the bottom portion of the pipe and air being the lighter phase will rest on the top portion of the pipe so that is what we are finding that at the bottom portion i have a liquid and then at the top portion i have gas and if the flow rates of both the phases are very small then we will not finding much disturbances at the interface and my interface is almost flat so this thing you can also observe in your single phase flow pipelines if your pipe diameter is bit larger and you are your pump is supplying water at very low flow rate okay so you will be finding in your day to day water pumping pipelines also that the entire portion of the pipeline will not be filled with water it will only the half portion of the pipe will be half or some portion of the pipe will be filled with the water and then in the top portion there will be nothing but existence of the air okay but in this case whatever the case i am talking about in that particular case there is no flow of air air is only staying just above the water but when, whenever i will be having the two phase flow pipeline then of course we will be having some blower which is allowing air also to enter into the pipe and flow at some particular flow rate and also uh, liquid is also flowing at some particular flow rate with the help of a pump okay so it means when liquid flow rate is so small that it is not able to displace the air and fill the complete portion of the pipe cross section in that case i will be having nothing but stratified design in the other way vice versa is also existing air flow rate is also so small that it is not able to displace the liquid and then full uh, fit the entire cross section okay so this particular type of simplified design will be exist and of course the analysis of this design will be very very simple because what we are saying that at the interface we don't have much disturbances present so if we don't have much disturbances present then particularly i can determine what fraction of the pipe cross section so pipe cross section will be looking like this say up to this fraction i have liquid and above this i have gas so i can say that in this portion of the pipe cross section whenever i will be using the wall shear stress in order to determine the pressure drop i can use the viscosity of the liquid in the above portion whenever i will be using the wall shear stress then i can use the viscosity of the gas and of course in between the two phases because the velocities of both phases are not same these are having some difference of velocities but this difference of velocity is so small that there is existence of no instability at the interface so simply i can apply the dynamic boundary condition of interfacial shear to determine the interfacial shear okay is this point clear so this type of design is actually existing in this portion and then one another point you can observe the meaning of this design map is if i take either this point this point this point this point this point so all these points are nothing but corresponding to different different values of liquid and gas mass flux okay so for all these points nothing but there will be existence of the stratified so it means flow design map is nothing but it is assemblies of all the data points which are showing a particular type of flow pattern and then for distinction we have actually some hatched portion okay now you can see that if i keep the liquid flow rates in the same level but if i keep on increasing the gas velocities what will happen gas inertia will increase and once gas inertia is increasing 
it will try to create the interfacial shear and because of the interfacial shear I will try to see that some sort of waves will appear at the free surface. Yes. Okay. At the liquid gas interface. So that is what is shown in this next case. So if I keep liquid flow rates almost in the similar conditions but if I increase the gas, yes please. Entrance, entrance is half half and second important point which also let me tell you regarding the entrance. Whenever we have to determine these flow pattern maps like in case of laminar and turbulent flow we say that whatever the measurements we are taking we are taking in the sufficient downstream of the entry point so that majority of my uh, measurements are in the fully developed region. Okay. So typically for single phase flows if I talk about laminar flow and turbulent flow my uh, entrance length is actually kind of a defined with good accuracy. No, not negligible. It is having some finite value, but it is defined with good accuracy. For example, if we talk about uh, uh, turbulent flow, then typically we say that in case of turbulent flow, my uh, length should be almost 50 times of downstream, 50 times of the diameter from the entry point. After that, I can say that my flow is fully developed. Is this one clear? So, in this particular case also, whenever one has to develop the flow resign map, it is taken into consideration that we should have sufficient length before the point we are actually visualizing so that entry effects are not coming into picture. However, definition of entrance length is actually a bit dicey in case of multiphase flows. Okay. So whatever the different flow pattern maps you will be finding in literature, a large number of flow pattern maps, maps are available. Say these are given by many scientists. Particularly for horizontal flow itself, you will find 15 to 20 flow resign maps in the literature. Okay. Now in each experiment, individual researchers have actually taken sufficient length as per their understanding. But it is not very clear that was that length sufficient enough to account to avoid the effect of the entrance effect. So that's why uh, particularly the flow resign maps with flow resign maps what we say is we say that if we merge together the multiple flow resign maps and if their boundaries are matching then it means whatever the combined map is coming that is kind of a justified map in order to proceed with the further. Like that particular map can be considered for generic situations, okay? Because phenomenon is so vast that there can be any kind of instability present in the system. Because that will be totally dependent upon the particular uh, arrangement of the experimental system people have used, okay? So that's why one desired point is at least whatever the turbulent lengths people have specified we should go beyond that but that is also not a very clear cut estimate the better estimate is if we are trying to uh, develop resign map in our laboratory scale experiments so it is better to keep entire pipe of the laboratory as transparent okay so that from entry point to the exit point actually you can continuously see the evolution of the phase distributions and then you can decide at what point kind of almost statistical similarity is coming in the flow distribution so that after that point you can define that okay your pattern is fully developed okay because depending upon the type of entrance you are using it will be having different different uh, evolution lengths so that's why uh, recommendation is to go for a complete optical pipe so a complete uh, transparent pipe okay is this one clear when laboratory scale setups are actually developed for this is this one clear so uh, what we were discussing that once we increase the flow rate mass flux keeping the liquid flow same then what will be happening because of the uh, 
inertia of the uh, gas, there will be some disturbances in the liquid. So when these disturbances are very smooth and these are not leading to some instabilities, then we are calling this as wavy or many times it is also called as stratified wavy flow. Okay, so sometimes it is also called as stratified wavy flow. So this is the resign. Now in between stratified and stratified wavy, you can see that I have this thick hatched portion. Okay, so this thick hatched portion is actually experimental uncertainty. It means in this portion, stability can instability can grow at any point of time because this is nothing but if in this point instability is sufficient enough, it will create the larger waves. If instability is diminishing, again it will settle down to stratified flow. So whatever the data points are there in this region, in this particular band instability grow can grow at any point of time. So that's why we have actually wide spectrum uh, to show the transition. There is no smooth transition about this. Okay. So in between these hatched portion either there can be growth of instability. So if growth of instability is there then that point will reflect nothing but a wavy pattern and if growth of instability is diminished then that point will reflect the purely stratified. Is this one clear? All are clear with this idea? Okay. <clears throat> now, one interesting fact. Now, what we do if we move towards the, again, towards the low gas flow, but increase the flow rate of the liquid, then what will we have? If I am increasing the liquid flow, then liquid will try to displace the gas and once it is displacing the gas, in this process liquid will try to almost fill the complete pipeline and whatever the gas is coming from the entry point, that will appear as discrete entities present in the liquid phase. Is this one here? So, this is your pipe, you can, simple experiment you can do. If in your normal pipeline, you start increasing the flow rate of the liquid at low gas flow, then what will happen? Liquid will start displacing the air, okay. And once it is displacing the air, if some air is coming from the entry point, then of course that air has also to go through that pass only, uh, that air has to pass through that path only. So air will also come, but it will come as isolated discrete entities, okay. So once air is coming as isolated discrete entities like this, so these are all nothing but gaseous phase and this is the liquid phase, then we will be calling this flow as bubbly. So typically bubbly flow will be observed at low gas flow rates and low to moderate gas flow rates and high liquid fluids. Is this one clear? And one interesting point, whenever you will be seeing the bubbly flow in the horizontal pipe, these bubbles will try to accumulate near the top portion of pipe. Why near top portion only? Yes, gravity is acting like this. So bubbles are nothing but lighter phase, gaseous phase is lighter phase. So because of the less density, it will try to stay near the top portion of the pipe. So that is why in bubbly flow, you can see majority of the times, the bubbles are actually staying in almost near the top portion. Is this point clear? So that is kind of a bubbly flow. Now in between, though they have not given, but in between bubble and slug, what is slug now? So if at same high liquid flow rate, if I start increasing the gas flow rate, so now what will happen? Earlier discrete gas bubbles were going, but now the frequency of these discrete bubbles will increase. Once their frequency will increase, they will come closer to each other. Once they are coming closer to each other, multiple bubbles will fuse with each other to form a 
gaseous core. Okay, so here you can see this is a big gas bubble and then there is some small liquid hump. So like this periodic gaseous cores will be actually moving in the bulk of the liquid. Okay, so this is called as a slug. Is this point clear? Of course, in their experiment, because these experiments are done in long back, so at that time visualization uh, facilities were not that high end, so they might not be have, so what, what we can anticipate is that they were not able to uh, clearly get hair boundary, but in this zone they are able to get the boundary. So that's why here also they have written slug, okay, but it is not very clear that what type of slug, so what you can do is, here you can say that this situation will be close to this plug. So rather than slug, we can say somewhere here it is like nothing but a plug. Plug means when you have a bigger bubble and that bigger bubble is moving. But when that bigger bubble is growing and trying to displace the liquid also below the pipe, then it is becoming a complete slug. So at very high gas flow rates, once gas also started displacing the liquid, then we are getting nothing but a slug over here. Is this one clear? Now, at the entire spectrum of this liquid flow rates, if I go to very high gas flow rate, then what will happen? In this case, we will be finding that this liquid will accumulate near the walls of the tube and at the center we will be having a gaseous core. Is this one clear? And this gaseous core are having this so many black colored drops. So black colored dots are nothing but the liquid drops present in the gaseous core. Is this one clear? So once you further increase the velocity of the gas at all liquid flow rates. So what gas will do? Gas will now try to displace the liquid. So gas is the faster moving phase. Gas will try to displace the liquid and it will try to reach the zone of the low shear. So low shear zone means it will try to move away from the wall in the core. So that's why this uh, liquid is actually getting accumulated across the wall of the pipe and gas is entering at the core. Okay, And whatever this liquid film we will be having, it will not be a straight liquid film. We will be having a number of waves at this liquid film. Okay, And some of these waves will grow in magnitude, uh, will grow in amplitude and detach some droplets and these droplets then will enter into the gaseous core. So this type of arrangement is called as actually annular flow arrangement. So this is kind of a annulus, annular tube. What happens in case of annular tube? We have two tubes, one tube and then another concentric tube. So space between two tubes we are calling as nothing but a annular space. So in a similar way by taking analogy from there, in the center we have a gaseous core and in the surroundings we have a outer periphery we have a liquid so that's why we are calling it as a annular flow okay one important point you have to keep in mind when we are talking about horizontal gas liquid flows if you look into the cross section of the pipe you will be finding that near the top portion the thickness of the annular film is less and as we are actually moving towards the bottom then thickness of the annular film be thick, yes, because of the gravity effect. At the same point of time, this will be wavy. So this will not be a very uh, smooth, it will be having so many undulations and because of these undulations, from these undulations, some liquid droplets will break and these will enter into the gaseous core. What no, because of gravity effect, this film will be thinner at the top and thicker at the bottom. Okay. 
flow is not rotating here flow is moving in a straight path so this is the displacement of a liquid in the outer periphery is because of the inertia and momentum of the gaseous phase because gas speed is so high that it is trying to displace the liquid and that liquid is actually entering into the outer wall but the thickness of this liquid will be asymmetric because of the presence of the gravity because uh, in top portion less liquid will stay liquid will try to accommodate the bottom portion of the body yes low shear zone meaning if you have a wall so in case of wall what is happening <coughs> pipe wall is stationary and then your liquid is moving in the forward direction so in that particular case my change of velocity from the immediate layer which is just in contact with the wall to the next layer is actually very high okay because because relative velocity will be large on contrary if you go to two layers of the fluids so both the layers are moving in forward direction so that's why in between them if relative velocity is less then shear zone will be shear rate will be less so that's why i am calling it as low shear zone okay now what i am saying is that uh, this is the feature of the annular flow now one interesting point if your liquid flow rate is extremely high okay if your liquid flow rate is extremely high so beyond this point then what will happen you will get here both the things are high so here you can see liquid flow rate is very large and then this is all the gas flow rate so here you will be finding that complete dispersion of a phase into the a gaseous phase into the liquid phase so this we are calling as nothing but a dispersed flow so this is i can call this as nothing but my fully dispersed flow is this point clear and these two particular phase regimes can be called as fully separated flow regimes okay these can be called as fully separated flow regimes and all the flow regimes which are other than these these are nothing but intermediate flow regimes between the wide classification of fully dispersed and fully steady so the dispersed phase may don't set like ye gas hai or yes. water gas yes yes gas in the liquid phase okay so that's why what i am saying is that in this particular zone we will be having so this is my fully dispersed flow so fully dispersed flow is one in which you cannot clearly segregate the interface okay and this type of flow model you can say that that the dispersed phase is almost homogeneously intermingled with the continuous phase so that's why here you can simply apply the averaged modeling averaged modeling means you can define effective density combined density for both the phases combined properties for both the phases and then accordingly you can solve this situation identical to that of a single phase flow situation by using the effective property on contrary separated flow model you can clearly apply two fluid modeling approach means one continuity and momentum equation for phase 1 another continuity and momentum equation for phase 2 and then you can clearly find the interaction forces between the two phases but whenever you have the intermediate phases then it becomes more challenging to go for a pure analytical approach because approximation of pure homogeneity is also not possible and approximation of pure two fluid model is also not present okay so we have to use some intermediate approach and sacrifice the assumptions of the individual uh, flow particular behavior okay so another interesting point you have to consider is if my this in the dispersed flows particles are very small so particles if particles are very small then these will immediately try to follow the continuous phase so my dispersed phase velocity will be equal to continuous phase velocity so it means pure homogeneous flow model but if 
particles are larger and dispersed velocity is not equal to continuous phase then the analysis will be becoming little bit more challenging is this one clear now one more thing you can see that along with this hatched portion there are some solid black colored lines also okay so these solid black colored lines nothing but these are the separation boundaries calculated from theoretical analysis okay so these separation boundaries nothing but are calculated from the theoretical analysis okay so for example if i say this is my wavy flow once if i apply here instability theory okay so there is one specific type of instability which comes into picture if we have relative motion between two phases and difference inertia along the interface so that is called as kelvin helmholtz instability okay so if you apply kh instability theory in case of wavy flow then that instability theory will tell you that after what flow rates the magnitude of this wave will amplify and under what range of flow rates the magnitude of this instability will diminish so if the magnitude of this instability is diminishing flow will remain stratified wave only but if the magnitude of this instability is starting amplifying okay so whatever the waves if their amplitude grows at very fast rapid rate in that case what will be happening flow will immediately turn into slug or bubbly design so here you can see that the boundary from this point to this point this particular boundary can be determined from kh instability okay and kh instability comes into picture if i have one particular interface and on the both sides of the interface i have different different inertia of the two phases so i have different different momentum of the two phases okay so in this scenario i will be finding that this is driven by kh instability but all the flow regimes are not driven by same type of forces because when you go from wave to annular then there can be some other form of dominant forces present in the system so that's why the theoretical analysis is possible not for all the boundaries but for some boundaries where actually uh you have the clear effect of dominant forces present in the system okay so there these boundaries can be classified based on the theoretical approaches as well okay so not right now but once we will be having some more discussion on the analytical solution of the two phase flows or multi phase flows then uh, slowly slowly we will also uh, try to see these boundaries how theoretically we can actually is this point clear all are clear with this idea now remember one thing this particular design map whatever we have seen over here this is applicable only for air water condition okay and in this particular design map we don't have any other effect at the moment like effect of other properties we have not incorporated so it means that if i only know about this map and if i change my fluid from air water to some other type of fluid where density is changing other properties are changing of course effect of density is included because uh, i have mass flux of water here but if other properties such as surface tension and viscosity is are actually being changed significantly then of course i cannot say that under these mass flow rates only i will be getting this particular type of okay so it means one has to go for some another type of design map once we are changing the fluid is this point clear now another important point here we have considered diameter of pipe as 5.1 cm if you change the diameter of the pipe then also 
there can be shifts in the boundary okay boundary can shift from this particular location to some other location okay sorry this will come under certain range but if you say change diameter significantly if you go to micro channels but that is effect of diameter you can see a circular pipe only if you go to a very large pipe which is of size of this room in that case what will happen gravity will be so dominant that liquid will always try to settle at the bottom okay so that's why this is situation specific as well now this is again another flow resign map for horizontal pipe flow and this particular flow resign map is for air water mixture in a 2.5 cm diameter pipe at 25 degree celsius and 1 bar pressure if you have pressurized system then of course there will be differences in the property so of course uh, majorly if you see majorly they have given the same names stratified flow elongated bubbly flow slug flow dispersed flow annular flow and wavy flow so majorly names are same and these are the theoretical boundaries and these are the hatched portions from experimental observations okay so here also you can see that theoretical boundaries are almost matching to the <coughs> experimental measurement and same was the observation in the previous case as well so it means that this resign map and this resign map particularly over here almost they are giving the same set of flow transition boundaries is this one clear now this is another flow resign map which shows the effect of pipe diameter so here we have three different diameter pipes 1.25 2.5 cm and 5 cm so you can see first pipe for 1.25 cm all the dotted lines so this dotted line is nothing but theoretical prediction for 1.25 cm one then this dash dot is for 5 cm line okay and 30 cm line is dashed line is this one clear so here you can see in larger pipe it is taking more amount of flow rate to enter into the dispersed phase design okay so there is some shift in the pipe so here you can see how much difference this is a huge difference so this much difference is coming when you are simply changing the diameter from 2.5 cm to 30 cm okay so this particular resign map over here is nothing but showing the effect of change in diameters okay then uh, in case of horizontal one whatever the previous resign maps i discussed these were applicable for air water means gas liquid flow in a horizontal pipeline along now i can have another type of flow which is liquid solid if i have liquid solid flow little bit i have discussed about this in my lecture 1 or lecture 2 as well so if we have a liquid solid flow the meaning is i have liquid as continuous phase and solid particles are actually dispersed in that liquid okay so when here this these flow resign maps depends upon two three factors one is particle size size of the particle second is volume fraction of particles of course density volume fraction of particles what if size you say size is less than 10 micrometers 
then density will not play much role. Okay. So particle size, volume fraction, and third, you can say the velocity of continuous phase. So when your diameter is say less than 10 to 15 micrometers and volume fraction is also not very high. Volume fraction is not high. It means that particles are not coming very close to each other. So particle particle forces are not dominating. Only dominant forces are whatever the continuous phase is applying on the particles. Okay. So if particle size is very small, continuous phase will have tendency to move particles along with the flow because relaxation time of particles will be very small. So in this scenario, if volume fraction is low, why volume fraction should be low? So that particle-particle interactions are not coming into picture and size is small, it means that their relaxation time is small. Okay. So if their relaxation time is small, in that case, I will be finding that particles are kind of homogeneously distributed within the continuous phase and this is called as homogeneous flow design. Now if you slightly increase the particle size, if you go say close to 30 to 50 micrometers and also increase alpha, volume fraction of particles. Okay. In that case what will be happening, some of the particles will start settling near the bottom. Okay, so in this case what will be happening, you will be having some concentration gradient over here. So in the top particle concentration is low and at the bottom particle concentration is actually increasing. Okay, so this is your say concentration profile. In the similar way velocity profile will also grow. Where particles are more in more concentration, their velocity will be a bit slower and in comparison to the portion where particles are very less, then their velocity will be high. Okay. So this is called as heterogeneous flow. And third is saltation or moving bed. The meaning of saltation is when particle volume fraction is so high that a number of particles have, as well as sizes are so small that a good number of particles have settled at the, completely settled at the bottom portion of the pipe. And of course, though these particles have settled, but still they are moving in the forward direction. So this is saltation resigned with moving bed. On contrary, if my bed has become almost stationary, then I will be having saltation resigned with static bed. Okay. So this will be in case of slurry flow resigns, it is nothing but the effect of three parameters, particle size, volume fraction of particles and velocity of the continuous phase which will control that what type of flow resign will be present. Okay. And of course, whenever we talk about the uh, this type of uh, systems, then one more effect comes into picture that is the roughness effect of the pipe. Because particles are so small, these will interact with the pipe surface. And in majority of the cases, you will be finding that whenever we talk about the slurry flow pipelines, these are having problem of erosion. Okay, because of the erosion, actually pipe uh, <coughs> material is damaged. Okay, so typically uh, this is a once again a significant. Uh, area where people are working and in order to improve some material characteristics so that there is less wear as well as uh, uh, the uh, pressure losses across the pipe which will be resulting in uh, operational cost and erosion of the pipe which is resulting in the capital investment. So these two can be actually decreased. Okay. Then of course, whenever we are talking about the pipe flow, then we can have in a pipe flow gas solid flow as well. Okay. So whenever we are having gas solid flow, what are the application areas? Asthma inhalers. In case of asthma inhalers, still we will be finding that 
particles are in very small concentration present. Volume fraction is very small. But if we talk about the flow through a long pipeline, industry scale pipeline, then major application is in actually fly as handling units or uh, uh, pharmaceutical industries or cement plants where these powdered bulk solids are actually pushed into a pipeline in order to transport these from one location to the another location with the help of the gas pressure. Okay. So in these scenarios, you will be finding that when gas velocity is very high, when gas velocity is very high, in that case what will happen? Particles will be and particle volume fraction is small. So particles will be kind of freely dispersed in the gaseous phase. So that is called as dispersed flow. So all these are nothing but the solid particles. Okay. And if you start decreasing the gas velocity, then what will happen? Some particles will start settling at the bottom okay, and start clustering with each other. So that is what is happening. So here we have a cluster and then above we have dispersed. So this is called as moving cluster flow. Then third point is further decrease in gas velocity will lead to a stationary bed. Okay, so this is a stationary flow. Then more decrease will lead to a very less particles at the top and majority of the particles are settled at the bottom. So at the bottom you will find almost a complete solid bed. So that is called as stratified flow. Okay. Then once these particles are starting increasing in size, then these are making a unstable flow where you can see the pressure drop across the pipeline is actually very large. Okay. Because if particles are settling then you need more amount of energy to push these particles. Okay. And then finally you will be finding that these particles are touching the top of the pipe and in between the particles you have some air pockets and these air pockets are trying to push the fluid, uh, push these particles forward. So this is called as slug flow. Okay. And of course in these two scenarios also uh, there are lots of classifications different people have used. So majority of these flows can be segregated into two types of conditions. One is called as dense phase pneumatic transportation and this is called as dilute phase pneumatic transportation. Okay. So if you talk about the pneumatic transportation systems then major classifications are dilute phase and dense phase. So in case of dilute phase what we do we keep the gas velocities high so that particles are actually suspended. Okay. So because of this what we will be finding we will be finding that my operating cost will increase because solid loading is very less. So in order to transfer small amount of solid I have to supply significant amount of air, gas. Okay. Second point is whenever I have this dilute phase, so we are keeping gas velocities very high. So because of the gas velocities, these particles are also moving at very high velocity. So these high velocity particles, when these will be interacting with the pipe surface, these will be creating more erosion. So here erosion wear will be actually very high. On contrary, if I go to dense phase, in case of dense phase, the amount of power required for pushing the solid particles is actually very large. So that's why pressure drop is large. But my gas velocities are very, very small. So if gas velocities are small, it means that we are in these scenarios will be less and amount of gas required will also be less. So there is kind of positive and negative effects of the both and in majority of the time we try to operate in certain resign close to this, close to these so that we don't have very high pressure drop and at the same point of time we don't have because extremely high pressure drop will lead to huge amount of pressure drop and the operating cost again. And we also we should not have very large velocity so that 
it is actually creating erosion of the pipes okay and uh, at the same point of time one tricky part is to decide how much should be the minimum velocity of the gas because if you go below some minimum velocity then ultimately what will happen your pipeline will choke okay so in that case what you need to do first you need to open the whole pipeline manually clean it and then again start the system so that is one very very important thing uh, majority of the times if you get some chance to visit a thermal power plant coal based thermal power plant so you will be finding that sometimes they have actually uh, big big hips of fly ash on the ground so these hips of fly ash on the ground uh, typically occur if their pipeline is actually blocked so in the meantime they have to open some bypass line which will be actually dumping simply the uh, air uh, this uh, fly ash out of the boiler unit otherwise it will actually it will actually block the it, you cannot uh, 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 operate the boiler if your entire uh, hopper is actually filled with the fly ash then it will be actually doing the overfilling of the hopper okay so yes that's why pneumatic conveying is one of the <coughs> most energy consuming method of transportation but why it is used because it will be nowadays in the present scenario considering the environmental pollution and other things we have to design our system by considering environmental constraints as our main objectives rather than the secondary things so that's why if you use a belt conveyor for transferring the uh, fly ash there will be two issues one is fly ash will be hot it will try to uh, actually create the difficulty in terms of uh, uh, flexible belt material it will lead to frequent failure of belt material second issue is if you use the belt conveyor for transferring the powders uh, then you will be having lots of environmental pollution so typically whenever the powders are transported we try to consider a closed system completely closed system for example uh, one is this pneumatic conveying second is actually called as air slide method so in case of air slide method one rectangular channel of uh, inclined uh, orientation is used and in that uh, rectangular channel what they do is they are having one flexible material at the center okay and at the top of that flexible material they are putting powdered material and from the bottom they are allowing air to pass through so what air does air penetrates through that uh, flexible material and it actually uh, lifts the small small powdered particles and then because of uh, the inclined orientation it try to displace these particles in the forward direction so that the particles should not stack at a single location because if you don't use air flotation then what will be used even if you are having an inclined pipe particles will try to clo clog at a particular location and they will form a blockage so that is called as air slide method particularly in majority of the cement industries when they have this uh, uh, powdered raw material and they move that powdered raw material from their raw mill which is making the pulverized form of the uh, powder when they move from that part to the kiln kiln is their furnace where they heat their raw material so majority of time they use uh, this uh, air slide method for transferring that okay okay so uh, this is all about gas solid flows of course this is once again a there are so many textbooks which are fully devoted for gas liquid flows or pneumatic conveying only we will not go into that much details but uh, uh, regarding the other flow regimes for uh, vertical pipe flow we will discuss in the next class then okay